Because cancer is a terrible disease. No matter what side of the nuclear issue you're on, it, most people understand that cancer is a terrible disease and we have to try to deal with it. We have with us two eminent scientists, Dr. Chris Busby and Dr. Jack Valentine. And uh, Dr. Busby has been the scientific secretary for the European Commission on Radiation Risk, ECRR, which was set up to deal with uh, issues related to the International Commission for Radiological Protection, where Dr. Jack Valentine has been the scientific secretary for many years and is now emeritus, just as of some short time ago. Well, I thought I would leave it at that. The format for today is going to be that uh, Chris Busby will give a presentation of about a half an hour, followed by Jack Valentine for the same period. Then there'll be a 15 minute break with uh, coffee and pastry outside. And then there'll be an interaction between the two and questions from the audience. So please, Chris. I think you can press your button. I'm, I'm oh, right. You're going to okay. get your PowerPoint going. Right. This one, yes, you can hear me. This is a historic occasion, in my opinion, um, because we have here um, the Scientific Secretary of the International Commission on Radio Committee on Radio Commission on Radiological Protection, uh, an, 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 inst an, an institution that has been uh, underpinning the basis of all the risk models for radiation and cancer since 1952. It, it is the model of the ICRP that permits nuclear power stations to operate, that permits. Um, the American military and the British military to use depleted uranium. Uh, it is this risk model which I am now calling into question, and which has been called into question for quite a long time. But it was in 1997, at a meeting of the European Parliament STOA group, that I first met Dr. Valentin. Uh, it was a meeting that was to address criticisms of the ICRP risk model that were, <coughs> that were being brought forward by a number of people, myself, Alice Stewart, Rosalie Bertel, Jean-Francois Viel, a number of eminent scientists um, who were arguing that there were problems with this model uh, and that it should no longer be employed um, for accurately predicting the effects of radioactivity. And at that time we set up a new committee called the European Committee on Radiation Risk and I will talk a little bit about those, uh, those developments. Uh, the model of the European Committee on Radiation Risk was developed and was published in 2003, and we have a meeting in Lesbos, in Greece, uh, in three weeks' time, to, to which anyone can come, where a number of eminent members of the European Committee on Radiation Risk will be discussing this issue and trying to take it forward. I, I have to be quite uh, rapid in this presentation because I need to get through quite a lot in quite a short space of time, so I'm going to blast my way through. Many of you people will already know a lot of this stuff, so forgive me, some of you may not. First of all, I just need to say that there are various types of radiation there, and the three main types that we need to discuss or consider at the moment are gamma rays, which are electromagnetic radiation like light, uh, and then energetic electrons, beta particles, and also alpha particles, which are uh, rather like Battlestar Galactica um, uh, in terms of their damaging power relative to, to Luke Skywalker's um, little white um, aeroplane things. Um, now, the electromagnetic radiation, the external radiation, the gamma rays, uh, they produce, on interaction with matter, with, with living tissue, they produce uh, fast electrons. And it is these fast electrons which cause the damage. They interact with tissue, they produce ionization, and that can damage the DNA, which is now known to be the target for these effects. Because if the DNA is damaged, then the cell can go out of control, ultimately, but the effects of these are not just uh, cancer effects, there are also a whole range of effects on human health. Uh, in fact, you could probably argue that nearly every type of human health condition can be affected or uh, harmfully by radiation. Um, now, as I said, ionization, ionizing radiation, whatever its source, external or internal, whatever, 
uh, it's absorbed by, but it produces these electron tracks, and it's the electron tracks that are the, that are the cause of the problem. They react with DNA, and they cause fixed mutations, cancer, and of course genetic defects which can be passed across the generations. Now, the important thing here to remember is that absorption of gamma radiation is proportional to the fourth power of the atomic number. Those of you who are chemists will know that all elements have an atomic number, which is basically the number of electrons in the orbits around the nucleus. The atomic number goes from 1 for hydrogen, which is the lightest element, right the way up to 92, which is the heaviest element, is uranium. Of course, we've got heavier elements now that are produced in nuclear reactors, but on Earth, those are the numbers. They go right the way up. But most of the elements in the human body have quite low atomic numbers. Um, and in fact, there are there's a reason for that. Now, radiation exposure and health has been modeled since 1952 on the basis of the cancer yield in the survivors of the Hiroshima bombs, the Japanese A-bomb studies. And this model uh, is essentially the model of the International Commission on Radiological Protection, the ICRP model, the model that I'm attacking today and have been attacking for considerable part of my life. Uh, and the reason that this model is false is because it is based on the assumption that all the cells in the body receive the same number of radiation tracks. But if you're going to model cancer and radiation, or if you're going to model health and radiation, you have to have some sort of um, unit that you can measure the radiation in. Uh, in order to say this number of units of radiation can be related to that amount of cancer following the exposure of the person. And the unit that was developed was a unit based uh, on physics, which was uh, energy per unit mass, and it's called absorbed dose. And so all energy <coughs> per unit mass, all absorbed doses, are, are related to the numbers of cancers that, that are produced following that exposure. It's not, however, a valid assumption for internal radiation, and this is where the problem is because the people who were at Hiroshima and Nagasaki were outside in the open, and there was a gigantic flash, and their bodies were bathed in gamma rays, and, it, and the energy from those gamma rays caused equivalent ionization in every one of the cells <coughs> of the body. And so it was quite reasonable to take that as a measure uh, of, of, of exposure, of, of harm, because all of the cells had the same amount of harm. But this is not true for internal radiation, because with internal radiation, you are exposed to fission products. These are substances which never existed on Earth prior to 1945. Substances which get inside the body and can attach to cells. And they have biochemical properties at the molecular level. And some of them are very, have a very high affinity for DNA. Strontium-90 is a good example. But there are others. Uranium is also a good example. So the external exposure model is modeled by physics. The ICRP, this is the original ICRP phantom. It's, it's like a bag of water. And so it's exposed to external radiation, and the dose is assumed to be the same for most of the tissues. But for internal radio, radioactive exposures, particularly also for particles, you can get this kind of effect here, where you can see that, and this is, uh, these are plutonium particles in a rat lung. Um, you can see what's called an alpha star. So this is like sitting in front of a fire and heating yourself, warming yourself up in front of the fire and you get an equivalent dose of radiation, in this case infrared radiation, all over your body. And the equivalent here would be to reach into the fire and to take out a hot coal and eat it. So we're at a position now that there is uh, an impasse between two separate risk models. A risk model developed by the ICRP in 1952, at that time probably quite reasonably, I guess, since they had to do something quickly, and now a, a, a set of, of models that the, IC, that the ECRR has developed in order to account for a number of anomalous discoveries. We have nuclear site leukemias. We have childhood leukemias near, near nearly all of the, 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 the atomic plants that were, where, where epidemiologists have looked. There's a sea coast effect on the Irish Sea due to material from Sellafield. There, there's an increase in infant leukemia in children who were in the womb at the time of uh, Chernobyl and a whole range of other things, part, some of which we'll I'll, I'll look at. So the ICRP radiation risk model is now manifestly and provably wrong, and in fact it's quite embarrassingly wrong. And, and this matters because it's resulted in the deaths of a very large number of people. Uh, the, the, the ECRR calculation of the cancer yield of the, the nuclear project, if you like to call it, I'll call it that, most of the radiation released to the environment this century 
is in the region of millions of people. 61 million people have died as a result of cancer produced by the radionuclides released during weapons fallout mainly. And we have all these epidemiological discoveries, the whole range of them here, that all have to be explained and cannot be explained on the basis of the ICRP model. And you have a whole list of theoretical falsifications of the ICRP model, of the basis of the ICRP model. The ICRP model is now bankrupt and needs to be tipped in the bin. The, so as I said, there are now two committees and two models for the health effects. And the ECRR model you can get from the uh, uh, Eurocom, you can order it from the, the ECRR or from Milkas, who, who have some copies. Um, now the, the ECRR, I just, I just put up some of the people in the ECRR, so we're not talking about people who who, like me, are perhaps not so important, but some ex extremely eminent scientists here. We're talking about, this woman here was the head of the Samanov Institute of Radiation Biology in Moscow, member of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Now she is the deputy director of the Institute of Biochemical Physics. There's a whole range of people here. Rosa Goncharova, who is a geneticist in Belarus, has found all sorts of effects following Chernobyl. These are people who are coming to this meeting uh, in Lesbos, uh, on the 5th of May, and, and as I say, anyone else can, can come, and, and prefer, uh, Dr. Valentin has been invited, and I think maybe someone might come from the ICRP, but I'm not holding my breath. Atmospheric nuclear testing killed babies. It caused increases in leukemia in areas of high rainfall in, in the United Kingdom. These are all from publications in the peer-review literature. Uh, this is an increase in childhood leukemia in Denmark over the period of weapons fallout in the 1960s. There is a, it, it's a result of a, of a deconvolution of a disgraceful, uh, disgracefully biased and dis almost dishonest report by a number of eminent epidemiologists working in, in, in collaboration with the British Nuclear Radiological Protection Board. This is the standardised incidence ratio of all cancers in Wales which you can see follows very closely the increase in strontium-90 20 years before. One of, this is from the, one of these graphs is from the cancer registry, the red one, and the green one there is from the, the previous exposure to strontium-90, taken, all taken from government documents. So what we're saying here with this is that the cancer epidemic that everybody knows exists is, has been caused by exposure to these same fission products, these substances like strontium and cesium and plutonium and uranium, of course, which were generated during the weapons fallout. Now, what all of these instances that I've mentioned have in common is that the, the doses, remember we talked about the absorbed doses, the absorbed doses as calculated by the ICRP are far too low to account for these these cancers on the basis of their model. And the, and, and, and the level of error is this, in, in these different cases. I mean, these are all clear uh, uh, situations where we have increases in childhood leukemia near nuclear plants. And in order to take the dose and calculate how many childhood leukemias you'd expect to find on the basis of the RCRP model, you're at by these factors. And you notice that one of the factors is 300, the minimum factor. That's an interesting number because it comes up again and again. And some of you will know that there's been a recently, a, a very large study done by the um, German cancer registries, uh, the Childhood Cancer Registry in Germany, which shows but a could, similar could effect. You, could you, with other words, explain virus effect, for example? I don't understand what's, what's standing there. What's standing there yeah. are, are the, this, is this, forget about this, this yeah. just came in somewhere else. This is a study that I've been doing in Wales, which I'll come on to, of, of cell field pollution. But anyway, what you have here is, in 1983, they discovered, just do one of them, they discovered an increase in childhood leukemia near the cell field nuclear, nuclear plant. They, they, they looked to see what the doses were to the children, and they had a dose of so many sieverts. It was, it was about 400 micro sieverts was the dose from the releases. Now, on the basis of the relationship between radiation and cancer, and leukemia, using the ICRP model, they, they, they have a, a risk factor which you can directly translate the doses into the number of cancers that you'd expect to find. And then what you do is you, you work out the number of cancers that the ICRP would say would occur on the basis of that dose, mm. and you divide it into the actual number of cancers that you see. And the number that you get is that, and you can call it like an error, if you like, a, a mistake factor or something like that. That number comes up again and again. <coughs> I've studied the Irish seacoast. This, uh, this is a very highly polluted area. 
substances are pumped out of the out of the cellophane plant. Historically, lots of plutonium and uranium and strontium and all that stuff, and it ends up on the beaches. And the beaches are like this: they're muddy beaches. This is a beach in, in Northern Ireland in a place called Carlingford. And this is a map of Carlingford. Uh, and we went and knocked on doors and we asked all of the houses in this whole area um, who had how many cancers there were. And you can see that the cancers were, are all next to the coast. And the, the rate of cancer by distance from the coast is given by this. So as you go further away from the coast, you get a, a rapid fall off of cancer. And we also found this in the Irish Sea Studies in, in um, uh, here we are, in, in, in Wales. So this is childhood cancer by distance from the coast in Wales, and this is adult cancer for all these different things, all cancers, leukemia, breast cancer, lung cancer, colon cancer, all by distance from the sea. So there is a sea coast effect associated with polluted coasts where there are fine sediment. A question there? Yes? Does this mean that you have, more people may live by the sea compared to... Anything? No, no, this is all factored in. Exactly. Yeah, sure. Sure. And, and the age of the people and, and the social class and everything you can imagine. Right, factor in, okay. I have to go fast here. You know, okay. to get all this no, but I just wanted to. And this, this is a, this is a hot particle from Sutherfield that has turned up in an edible muscle. So this is just to show you that that stuff is there. Okay. Now this is another nuclear site at Bradwell in Essex, and this is this is representing breast cancer risk, and this is also a very muddy estuary. This little, uh, this is the sea here. And so this is a muddy estuary here, and there's a nuclear power station, and you can see that the risks are much higher close to the radioactive mud. And we, we kind of know what the reason is, too. It's because the sea, the sea influence of the, of the waves causes a re-precipitation, a, a resuspension of the particles in the fine sediment, and then they blow ashore. And they drop out over a period of approximately the same distance that you see the, 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 um, the effect that exists. So it's about one kilometer. So people living within one kilometre of the coast inhale higher levels of plutonium, and in fact we find them in, radio, in, in autopsy specimens, so we know that they're there. You can, you can cut up animals, you can cut up human beings, in fact the National Radiological Protection Board did just that, and showed that there was plutonium inside the tracheobronchial lymph nodes of the people living near the coast. We set up a committee, I managed to get the, the British uh, government to set up a committee, but effectively um, the, per the, the minister who set it up was sacked by Tony Blair and the final report was, was, uh, was altered and constrained. So, that, so just to show you that people know about these things. And they, how much time have we got? We've got uh, still 20 minutes. Oh, have we? All right, minutes. then we can go back to this then. Um, well, anyone who wants to know about this cherry process will find a lot on the internet about the disgraceful way in which the, this attempt to, to, to bring these issues to the attention of the government was was uh, controlled and altered by legal threats and all sorts of, of, of shenanigans. But we made a minority report, which is called the Cherry Minority Report, and that's available. You can buy that, and it gives the whole story. And also my book, Wolves of Water, where I've talked talked a lot about this stuff too. Now there is an unequivocal proof of the error in the ICRP risk model, and this was published in the year 2000, but it's never been. It's never been cited by any of the radiological risk people in any of their, any of their publications. They've just completely ignored it. Uh, and this looks at leukemia in infants, not only in Wales and Scotland, because this is Wales and Scotland that I'm going to talk about, but, but it was first drawn attention to the scientific um, and, and medical public in peer review literature that there was an increase in, child, in infant leukemia in Scotland uh, just after the Chernobyl accident, and then also in Greece, and then also in Germany, and then also in America, and then I came in with my Wales and Scottish study. So we've got five different studies that all show that there was a sharp increase in infant leukemia, that's leukemia in children in the age group 0 to 1, who were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident. Now you will probably not know, but the Chernobyl accident in terms of absorbed dose produced very, very little absorbed dose. So the maximum absorbed dose in, uh, to a fetus, in, in, to a child in the womb, was in the region, in the Chernobyl affected territories, of about two millisieverts. Just think of that as a number. Um, that's about the same as the natural background radiation rate that you'll get in a whole year, two millisieverts. It's approximately the same. So if we're talking about dose, this dose is not very big. So any person at any time will get a dose of two millisieverts. But there was an extra dose from the Chernobyl accident in the Chernobyl affected territories 
of too many seabirds, according to the radiation risk people. And by the time you got to places like Scotland, the dose was about 100 micro seabirds. So that's 0.1 of a seabird, all right? So with the 0.1 of a milli seabird. So that's about 1 20th of the natural background average dose in a year. So these are tiny, tiny doses as absorbed doses. Of course, they're not absorbed doses in that sense because they're not external radiation. They have to do with internal radiation from these isotopes that were released from Chernobyl, cesium-137, tellurium-132, iodine-131. Um, uh, and that plutonium came to Wales too. So there were internal doses to these infants, and we looked only at those infants who were exposed in the womb at the time over the period of the Chernobyl accident. And, and here's the numbers for Wales and Scotland combined. And you can see, you don't need to be an epidemiologist to see. I mean, they're small numbers, but you can see that just after Chernobyl, the, the rate went up. Do you see? It went up by a factor of about four. Now, we also know that in uh, Greece, it went up by a factor of about three, I think. In Germany, by a factor of two. Uh, interestingly, in America, by a factor of one and a half. And in uh, Belarus, which is the only other place where anyone published, it went up by a sm quite a small amount, by I think 1.4, about 40%. So, so the effect was not dose-related, but the effect was certainly there. And so using that, we can see what the ICRP model predicted on the basis of the dose, and we can divide it into the number of children who were actually uh, diagnosed with, with leukemia in that year, in that um, cohort. And what we got was a, a factor of about 300. So we're back to that number of 300. So there's a, there seems to be some error in the ICRP risk model for internal radionuclides of the order of 300 to maybe 1,000. Okay. Of course, the radiation risk community said that there was no problem after Chernobyl. I mean, this is Abel Gonzalez talking in 2000 at, the, uh, at a conference in Kiev. And there's, a, there's an interesting DVD here, if anyone wants to see this. is from a film that was made by Swiss television called Atomic Lies about the way in which that conference resulted in all sorts of bias and dishonesty and cover-up and, and, and general skullduggery by people like Gonzalez. These people are crooks. They should go to jail. No question. I would maybe say worse. Anyway. Uh, maybe not. I'm a Green Party spokesman. I can't say worse than that. <laughs> maybe they should just be sent to a desert island somewhere with a lot of nuclear waste. Um, and, and this is Alexei Yavlikov, who is a member of the Russian Academy of Sciences, and he's at the same conference saying that members of the Soviet Statistical Ministry were arrested for falsifying health records. It was so bad that they actually reduced the number of leukemias in the Chernobyl cleanup workers to the extent that the people ended up more healthy than the general public. So nobody was allowed to record leukemia after Chernobyl, you see. Uh, and of course, when somebody did start calling attention to problems, like Professor Yuri Bandashevsky also, a member of the ECRR, and, and coming to this conference in Greece, he was locked up by the government for eight years' hard labor. And that's also, you'll see on this DVD. So, so we're talking about some very heavy people here, some very big dogs. And I'm so glad to have their representative here, uh, Dr. Valentin, because I should be asking him some serious questions about this. Now, if you want to know what happens to Chernob in Chernobyl, there is a book that we have just republished. We published it in 2000. And six, and now there's a new edition of it, 2009. And what it shows is that what's happening in the Chernobyl affected territories is disastrous. It's terrible. People are dying like flies. The, the average lifespan has come down by 10 years. The, the birth rate has fallen catastrophically. Uh, about in five children, only one of them is healthy. Four children are unhealthy. It's just appalling. If you listen to Bandashevsky talking about this or any of the other people who are from there. And all of this information was published in Russian language peer review literature, some of it in the West, and none of it has been considered by any of the Western radiological risk agencies. The ICRP report in 2007, I think it was the latest one, barely mentions Chernobyl. Now I'm going to go, just finish by talking about depleted uranium, or what I call uranium weapons. This is the latest tragedy in the pollution of the environment. And, and many of you will know that, rate, that uranium is, uh, is, is a byproduct of the nuclear industry and it's been being used in the last 20, uh, 20 years, well, 18 years, as a weapon in order to destroy tanks. And it causes a whole range of effects in people living in the countries where it's been used and also in the veterans who have been firing it and who have been exposed to it generally. 
And I, I've been to Iraq and I've been to Kosovo. I've measured the stuff. It sticks around a long time. It flies all over the place. There I am in Kosovo in a nuclear biological kit with Nippon television. Um, we brought back depleted uranium. One year after it had been used, it was still there. So this is my final theoretical falsification of the ICRP model. It has to do with the uranium and its ability to absorb gamma rays, which I talked about earlier. I've been drawing attention to this since 2002, um, uh, but more recently it's become more important because we managed to get the story into a number of journals. Uranium has this high atomic number, and so it absorbs about 200,000 maybe times more radiation, gamma rays from natural background radiation. This is a fourth power relationship between um, the atomic number of uranium and the atomic, effective atomic number of water. And if we say that the effective non atomic number of water is one, we just ratio it all to that. Uranium will absorb 585,000 times more gamma rays. Well, where does that energy go to? Well, it goes into the tissue where the uranium is. Now, where is that tissue? Now, we find that that tissue is the DNA, because uranium binds very strongly to the DNA. The affinity constant for uranium and DNA has been measured by an American called Nielsen, and it's extremely high. So it means that very low concentrations of uranium, and we can't be certain about this, because this is all done in a test tube, you know, we don't know about in people, so experiments need to be done. Um, but we certainly know that uranium is likely to be on the DNA. So if uranium is on the DNA and it's absorbing all this radiation, where does the energy go? Well, it goes into these fast electrons that I was talking to you about. But in this case, the electrons are called photoelectrons. And they whiz out of the uranium, which is stuck on the DNA, and they whiz into the DNA. This is a coiled up form of the DNA, chromatin. Um, and this is what it looks like when you take a cross section of it. And this is, this is a, a uranium ion, uranyl ion, UO2++, on the same scale as the cross-section of the DNA. So you can see that having uranium on your DNA and standing in natural background is not going to be very good for your health. Now, we have actually done a study of this using a Fluker model, um, uh, which was developed by CERN in Geneva to look at particle physics. My colleague, Andrea, Andreas, has, has done this, done this uh, study, and this is, uh, he sends a beam in to a 10 nanometer diameter hypothetical uranium particle in a vacuum. And he compares the absorption of this with the absorption of water and of gold particles of the same diameter. And I'm asking you to look at the top of this now. Now, in this one, in his Monte, he puts in, one fa uh, he puts in um, 100,000 photons. So, so th th this, this, in this, so you get four tracks, four electron tracks out of a little particle of water if you put in 100,000 photons of natural background radiation, you see? So what, do you see this, what this experiment is? It's, it's having a hypothetical water or tissue particle and it's bathing it in natural background radiation and it's looking to see how much, uh, how many uh, elect fast electrons come out. And you can see four fast electrons come out for 10,000, for 100,000 photons. For gold, which has an atomic number of 72 or something, no, uh, 79, I forget. Anyway, that sort of order. So it's got quite a high atomic number, gold. You get a lot more, because there's a, this is only 1,000 photons now, and you've got all of these tracks. And of course, uranium, 1,000 photons, you've got rather a lot of tracks. Uh, and, and this is not hypothetical, because a man in, Ameri in America called Heinfeld has done this experiment with mice, and he's, he's put uh, the gold nanoparticles into tumors in mice and irradiated them with x-rays, and he's destroyed the tumors. So he's actually using this and has patented the method to destroy tumors. And so therefore it works. So this falsifies the ICRP model theoretically for uranium exposure. And the ICRP model for uranium exposure underpins all military arguments that uranium weapons are safe. So I think at that point, I have to say, checkmate. This is a uranium bomb in Lebanon. So we, the word underpins can explain it. Who? Underpins. Where? You have a word which underpins. Yeah. What? Supports. Supports. Mm -hmm. Did I? I don't remember saying underpins. that. Oh, underpins. Oh, yeah, sure. Underpins. It's like you put it underneath it. Like it's when you when you when you hold up a house, you underpin it. You put stuff underneath it. Not support. Mm -hmm. So it's so, support. Yeah. Not support. Yeah. Okay, so this, so this is my uranium thing, okay? So these are the conclusions, and I'll finish with this. Again. The increases in childhood leukemia and other childhood cancers are primarily caused by exposure to internal man-made radionuclides. 
The ICRP model, which is used to underpin the operation of nuclear plants and discharges of radiation to the environment, are, are, are just nonsense. They're embarrassingly wrong. Those people should just they should put on sackcloth and ashes and check into a monastery for the rest of their lives to sit down and, and, and kneel in penitential prayer. <laughs> and so this is arguable in terms of theory, and it's clear in epidemiological studies and specifically in the Chernobyl infants. The current cancer epidemic in adults is, has the same cause, and therefore it's time to reassess the risks of radiation. And here's the yield. You see? It's 61 million cancer deaths. 1,600,000 infant deaths. Since which year? This is the whole of the, this is, this is the, whole of the nuclear five. releases it's from 1945 to 1995, okay? I mean, I, I think up to 1992 I've got here. And the loss of quality of life, and the blame for this can be squarely placed at the door of those scientists and administrators who developed and supported the scientific risk model. And I say that this is a war crime. This is a crime. And it's far greater magnitude than any that has occurred in recorded human history. This is serious, serious stuff. And if I make jokes sometimes from time to time, it's because I have to in order to deal with the extraordinary awfulness of it. And you can learn more about this from these websites. Thank you. audience to try to please keep the questions until to later, after, after the break. Thanks, Miles, and thanks, Chris, for your presentation, which was quite interesting. And uh, thanks also for being here. The main thinking is it's fairly difficult to get into your line of thinking. We, we haven't seen you earlier publish material in uh, uh, peer-reviewed press. Uh, that has changed. Certainly, I admit that, uh, but it, it may signify, I believe, some sort of a change of attitude that you've actually invited us to participate at your conference in Greece. Uh, I'm not the right person to go. In fact, uh, back at the time of Noah's Ark, I knew a little bit about genetics. Now I know quite a lot about how to shuffle papers. Uh, we have about 20 people currently, this very week, at a meeting in the United States discussing the details of internal emitters and the problems of dose calculations, problems of uncertainties, all of that stuff. Um, in May, there will be a large international meeting where I've seen that a lot of the people from ICRP will participate. I didn't see any of the names from ECRR, but maybe you're there, maybe it's just that I don't know all the names. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say is there seems to have been a, a bit of a dual culture uh, and it's an advantage if perhaps we can get slightly closer and talk to each other and of course I'm happiest if we can avoid throwing rotten eggs at each other and perhaps discuss what might be the technical differences between our opinions. So what I'm trying to say here is, first of all, what is ICRP uh, and what are our, our roles and those other organizations and uh, what is the development where we started out with the intention of protection of medical staff and now our hope is that we're protecting man and the environment. Uh, then a little bit about the radiation risks and the scope of radiological protection and sources and effects. Uh, something about where we seem to agree more or less and something about the areas where we certainly don't agree. And uh, it all began, as you all know, in 1895. This nice picture shows uh, Renchen demonstrating his X-rays in Würzburg. And uh, this is interesting because the X-ray tube is actually completely unshielded. So all of these people are exposed to radiation. We wouldn't like that to happen, of course. Um, Regation was quickly found to be dangerous already after one year. Uh, an American named Emil Grubé described dermatitis due to 
uh, X-ray exposure. He was a, a person of vivid imagination, so much of what he later said turned out to be completely false. But it, certainly he was one of the very first victims of radiation. And uh, another American called Wolfgang Fuchs uh, published some advice on how to protect your hands at that time, which actually summarizes the golden rules of radiological protection already after one year. Reduce the time that you're exposed, keep a distance to the source and shield yourself if you can't do these other things. And at the same time, of course, one of my heroes, Madame Curie, was working in Paris. Uh, not too easy to be a single mother at a university which hated women and uh, thought they couldn't understand mathematics. And uh, uh, she made lots of interesting and important discoveries and then unfortunately she died of leukemia, uh, which almost certainly depended on her own exposure to radiation. During the early 20th century, uh, concerns about, uh, about radiation safety escalated because more and more doctors had most terrible wounds and many of them actually died. And, uh, that this was the beginning of ICRP, which was formed in 1928 under a different name, the International Extreme and, and Radium Protection Committee. And as it happened, that, that was here in Stockholm, uh, and the first chairman was Rolf Sievert, known because of the name of the unit. Uh, most Swedes have no idea that we have a, a famous, had a famous scientist here who was instrumental in making sure that radiological protection exists. We are a registered charity in the United Kingdom. Uh, we are established to advance for the public benefit the science of radiological protection by providing recommendations and guidance on uh, ionizing radiation. Uh, the structure is such that there is a main commission. This is currently led by, by the chief medical officer of this country, the head of the Swedish National Health Service, Socialstyrelsen General Director, Lars Erik Horn. Uh, and then we have five different committees dealing with various aspects of protection. Uh, I have just retired, so for the next period, uh, a Canadian called Chris Clement has taken over my job. Uh, he was head of radiological protection at the Canadian uh, Licensing Authority until he took the job. And this summer, a radiologist in the United Kingdom, Claire Cassins, will take over as chairperson. And, of course, this structure was known 500 years ago. You can see the chair puffs are up there, and here I'm talking to my wife. However, as you've already heard, not just Chris, but I think Chris and the nuclear industry seem to agree on one thing, that this might be a better representation of ICRP. Because <laughs> you need to recall that whilst Chris is talking about us underestimating risks, something horrid, there are large other groups of scientists, which I find equally strange, who are claiming that we are overestimating the risks, that the risks are not at all as high as we have said. Uh, a couple of words about what we are and what we are not, because the three uh, organizations that Chris represents, three in audit, the Low Level Radiation Campaign, and uh, the European Commission uh, Committee on uh, uh, Radiation Risks, they all have information on their websites, which is patently false and misleading about ourselves. We were created by radiologists, not as success at LNRC by the nuclear industry. We also were not created by ourselves. Uh, we are independent. We are self-elected to remain independent. I might add that Greenpeace, an organization quite negative to nuclear, is also self-elected. The French Academy of Science is very positive to nuclear, is also self-elected. We do not have a position on nuclear power. It is not our remit to say that nuclear power is good or bad for you. Uh, we're financed by grants from government and by sales from our reports. We do not get one red cent from the nuclear industry. And we are primary biologists and medical doctors Quite a lot of physicists, but there are more biologists and medical doctors. We have public health experts and many other types of people, mostly from universities and export bodies, and uh, a lot of people from regulatory authorities. We are not from, by, supported by, 
checked by or anything from the nuclear industry. In the cosmic scheme, the United Nations has a scientific committee on the effects of atomic radiation where they publish uh, huge reports in which I fail to say uh, much about uh, Chris' work, which may be because they are also stupid, but the committee is very large and includes quite a lot of uh, people who are working since many, many years with radiation. This science is published uh, on direct orders of the General Assembly. And that remit is to say, here's how much radiation there is, and this is how dangerous it is. We use that material to express, because there's so much radiation, and because it's supposed to be this dangerous, we think that you should, blah, blah, blah. In order to be practically useful, that in turn has to be translated into legalese, which is done both by the United Nations, this is the most important thing for, for the world at large, and by the European Union, which is perhaps more important in a country like Sweden or the United Kingdom. They translate our recommendations into regulations which are of the art thou shalt. The other recommendations from ICRP were only concerned with occupational exposures in medicine and uh, had very high dose limits to boot. Uh, then we realized that perhaps other people than just people in medicine worked with radiation. And at the time, of course, radiation was basically good for you. There were safe thresholds, people thought. There would be no environmental concerns. What you can see here is face powder, which is radioactive to make you radiant. This is a radioactive compress. This is a telescope where you check the size of your shoes in case you wanted to do that with radiation and just, instead of just feeling. But things changed with the advent of accelerators, reactors, fallout, the tragic event with the Japanese fishing boat, the Lucky Dragon, which was exposed from Bikini. Uh, we were renamed the International Commission on Radiological Protection because we realized that there were so many more things than just X-rays and radium. Excess leukemias were observed among the survivors in Japan, and radiation had become a concern for members of the public. So then uh, we published further uh, reports where we realized that it was important not just to avoid burning holes in yourself, which was what we had worked with before that, but also to minimize uh, genetic damage and cancers. This is what's called stochastic harm. And uh, uh, we realized that because, uh, as we agree with Chris, uh, any dose of radiation confers some level of risk, there's no safe dose. And because of that, uh, we felt that a dose limit is not really an important thing. The really important thing is to reduce doses below whatever limits there are and that the, this optimization, uh, the requirements on that has increased more and more and at the same time developments where, where risks appear to be higher on the survivors in Japan than we had thought at first uh, caused us to reduce the dose limits as well and we developed this system of protection where any use of radiation has to be justified, i.e. more good than harm uh, protection has to be optimized, so doses need to be as low as reasonably achievable. Uh, why not technically achievable? Well, if you've got a dentist, uh, you put uh, plasterboards, deep uh, sweeper in the wall to avoid radiation to the public. And now you could have five meters of plasterboards and you'd still be able to detect some radiation outside that. Uh, there comes a time when you feel Enough is enough. Um, right, and the final stage would be application of those limits. And uh, one of the seminal people here was Carl Morgan, uh, a friend of, of uh, uh, Alice Stutes and Rosalie Battelle's, who, who was uh, the, the person really who organized for us to know about internal emitters. And, uh, together with a report on, on external uh, radiation, the, these uh, reports that were published around the end of the 50s, 
established ICRP as what was in most people's sight the leading international radiological protection authority. Now, one of the problems, of course, is that we have uneven distributions of radiation, and this was uh, addressed in 1977. We thought at that time that we knew how to weight a whole body dose out of uneven distributions, and uh, Wolfgang Jacobi uh, devised the effective dose equivalent, which permits combinations of exposures from different sources at different times, from external and internal exposures, and permits comparisons of the different exposures. And all of this, of course, is very practically important in protection. The documents up to 1990 happened to be more logical than readable, I, I must confess. Incidentally, for the Swedish participants, I, I can just confirm that yes, my cartoons are made by the single mother, Elsa Mahama, known to most Swedes of our age. Um, the 2007 ICRP recommendations that Chris mentioned, uh, they cover all exposures, including those to other species than, than man. We still have a lot of work to do before we have a fully functional system, but at least we claim that that is our ambition. And uh, we have introduced uh, details about something we call dose constraints, levels of individual dose below the limits, in order to focus more on the individual's rights. We've updated uh, the science, but uh, uh, the overall risk estimates remain much the same as they were in 1990. During this process, which included a 10-year period with two completely public consultations, uh, we got comments, not least from, uh, not from Chris, I, as far as I can remember, but from your friends in LLRC, uh, which compared me and my friends to Hitler, which was interesting. You can see this because, of course, all our, not, not just our documents, but also the comments that are put from the public on our documents are visible on our website. So you can see that, that at least one of Chris's colleagues regards me as Hitler, something I find somewhat revolting with my Jewish heritage. <laughs> uh, the report uh, in 2007 updated tissue weighting factors. I'm not going to go through the details, just to indicate the, the amount of science that we produce. Radiation weighting factors were updated. We have new computational phantoms. Chris showed you an older phantom which we used in the past. We now have a much more realistic phantom based on real photos of real human beings. Uh, we uh, recall, of course, that uh, accidents must not happen, which is a human failure problem. We state that the effective dose that we use is there just for protection purposes. It's not something that is supposed to be used uh, for exact calculations of individual risks. It's there for the prospective planning of protection. But if you have a, an individual person exposed, then you need to do something else. Likewise, the collective effective doses for protection purposes, for optimization, for comparing options, but not for risk assessment, and particularly not for predicting the number of cancer deaths due to trivial exposures to large populations. If you multiply a very small number, i.e. the risk to an individual of the most types of exposure, with a very large number, i.e. a large population, all of whom are exposed, you get huge uncertainties. So with, quote, our, unquote, type of methodology, some people would stand up and say, uh, the risk uh, from uh, Chernobyl would be 40,000 deaths. And some other people would stand up and say, no, it's 400,000. And we wouldn't be able to say which one is right, because that's the sort of error you get. And therefore, we would say, it's much more important to focus on the fact that Chernobyl was a tragic accident. It must not happen again. This is a completely different take on the problem. So basically also we have the, the uh, problem with collective dose that it's logical in the sense that it equates many small doses to a few large doses. But is it right? No, not necessarily. Think of 
road traffic accidents where about 500 people die in a year in a country like this, but, and, and people don't give a shit. But if an aeroplane falls down and 500 people die at one time, well then it's a big problem. So we're not logical in other respects, and therefore need not be logical in radiation. The ethics we're basing all of this on is utilitarian at the outset, because uh, a utilitarian feels that an action is good if its consequences cause net benefits to the whole of society. And justification and optimization are exactly that. Uh, Chris was using Star Wars, so let me briefly go to, to uh, uh, oh goodness, what's the name of Spock and uh, Kirk? Uh, Star Trek. Yes, Star Trek, thank you. Uh, <coughs> the, the picture is from a scene where uh, uh, the, their battleship is somewhere in, in a problem and something's gone arise, so somebody needs to go in to a radiation area, press the red button and die, but this saves the ship. And Spock says, I'll do it. And then Kirk says, no, you can't, you'll die. And Spock says, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And this is basically the philosophy between uh, underlying justification and optimization. However, we also have some duty ethics uh, where we say some actions are right or wrong, irrespective of their consequences. Uh, of course, those limits in radiological protection are an example of that. You must not exceed, uh, exceed the dose limit, no matter what. Likewise, uh, these new dose constraints put more emphasis on duty ethics and more emphasis on protecting the individual. And actually, in the next uh, uh, part of, of Star Trek, uh, Suddenly, uh, Kirk said, we need to find the corpse of, of uh, uh, Spock because if we just pick up the corpse somewhere in, in, in the, this uh, eternal space, then we'll surely make him live again. And uh, people in, in the ship doubted that. But then Kirk said, the needs of the one outweigh the needs of the many. Although in this case, perhaps the many were in fact the viewers of Star Trek who needed Spock to be alive again. Uh, I put Whistler's mother there because we all need to protect our mothers, don't we? So hopefully you would have found the recommendations interesting if you'd re read them. Now, to finalize, radiation risk. Uh, well, what are the doses? We know that Chris doesn't like doses, but let's at least know what they are. Uh, the natural background dose is 2.4 millisiemens to an average earthly, half of which roughly comes from radon. Uh, the dose from other types of exposure, from, from man-made exposures, are dominated entirely by medical diagnosis. Um, nuclear power has increased over the years, of course, the global average dose is uh, 0.0002 millisieverts, but if you live near a plant, the dose would be 0.02 millisieverts. Um, some of this huge amount of medical is, of course, justified. It saves lives. I've, I've been irradiated and happy because of it, and you too. But there's been a 600% increase in the United States over the last 25 years. The collective dose due to medical radiation in the United States is now just as much as the natural background and, more amazingly, the doses from the use of computed tomography are of the same order of magnitude as the total integrated dose for all time from Chernobyl. Another comparison, of course, uh, atmospheric weapons testing, much, much more than either of these 20 million months of it. But the of course, this comparison is unfair because medical radiation is used basically for good purposes. But imagine that 1% of it could be taken away as unnecessary. And we all know that more than 1% is a waste. That, that would be the same as removing all occupational exposures. This gives you something to think about. And of course, 
Lots of doctors perhaps don't send you uh, to a CT examination just for a common cold. But here's a website where you can buy a gift certificate to give to your friends so they go through some more radiation. Uh, here's another example. Uh, publi uh, publicity material from a computer tomography machine uh, producer who says if only you maximize the number of patients, you can take 10 patients a day and then you'll earn $2 million in five years. Not, not the sort of message we'd like to send around. And then on the other hand, of course, you wouldn't want to go to a dentist who's happy to pull your teeth rather than just take an x-ray of them. Uh, you might say that I put too much emphasis on medicine. It's not to say that Chernobyl is a small matter. It's to say that we have many different problems and I think medical misuse of radiation is also a big problem. The effects of radiation, as we heard, are basically in DNA. DNA can be repaired such that there's no effect. This happens most of the time. All the time, I'm radioactive, you're radioactive, 5,000 disintegrations every second in my body. Um, most of them repaired, of course. The cell could die, and if many cells die, you get a, a hole in your body, and basically this hole can kill you if it's a nasty hole. And then the worst part if it's the cell survives that is mutated, in which case, of course, you can get a cancer or a genetic effect. Our basic assumptions are that high doses are needed to get these deterministic seal killing effects, but that uh, all forms of dose can give you a cancer or hereditary effects, and we believe that a linear th no threshold model is suitable to talk about the, the possible effects. If you look at uh, the whole of the dose range, obviously if you have high doses you can get more than linear effects. Uh, if you have this area, we extrapolate a linear no threshold model. Uh, Chris doesn't like that because he feels that in this area there are higher risks. And I think, if I understand you right, that you wouldn't like me even to use the term dose because of the other type of, of effects that you're talking about. Uh, some other people are talking about uh, thresholds which make this area completely safe. And some people are even talking about hormesis, where they claim that it's good for you to be irradiated with low doses. So there are all sorts of people. How is this work deterministic and stochastic? I've seen many yeah, times. Deterministic is when you think you get a burn, uh, when, when you get a hole in because cells die. Stochastic, that's randomly occurring damage, like cancer or uh, genetic damage. The health effects we're talking about, well, if you have a high dose, then certainly you can see both radiation sickness of this kind and cancer. Um, and you can determine at these stages that there is a direct relationship between the individual person's uh, death and, and uh, uh, radiation. And this is what uh, Abel was talking about. What ICRP and Abel Gonzalez, of course, also think is that we are absolutely sure that there are many, many cancer cases where you can prove the fact that there are cancer cases, that there is an excess, but you cannot prove for a specific individual that this person got that cancer simply because of radiation. And to claim that Abel would not accept this is a falsification. You can't say that sort of thing, Chris, because people won't listen to you. I, I believe, honestly, that you have a number of important things to say. Don't waste time with such silly comments when you can talk about the technicalities, where perhaps you could convince us that some of our ideas are wrong. Then we have a really low uh, area where we still believe, because of biological uh, reasoning that there is a cancer uh, due to radiation, but where we cannot even prove the existence of this cancer. It's just because of logical thinking. Um, right. Um, so the, the probability coefficients we are working with are 
at this moment in time, 5.7% for the whole population and a little less for adults because children are more sensitive. It used to be slightly higher, but we're stating very clearly that of course there's uncertainty. So when you're using these numbers for protection purposes, the overall risk coefficient of 5% is appropriate. And do we over or underestimate the risk? Well, that depends on whose eyes you're looking with. And it, it pleases me that at least I'm not at the end of the scale. So where do we agree? Well, I don't think that we have any discrepancies when it's about deterministic effects of high doses. Uh, when we have, talk about low doses from external sources, there are differences with not huge ones, like interpretations of epidemiology, assumptions about repair, non-targeted effects, uh, modeling for genetic risk, where as a pensioner I can say that I, I personally believe that ICFP has overdone it a bit, that, that the risk is a bit higher that, because of certain assumptions that I think were wrong. Um, the exposures from intakes are more complicated, we agree about that, there's variable duration, uh, there's heterogeneity, there's uncertainties on a lot of things, including the photoelectric effect that Chris has been talking about here. But there are also some areas where we disagree. First of all, the concept of dose, where we feel that the model we're using is actually useful for radiological protection purposes. You calculate the intake, you add biokinetic and dosimetric models, which I believe Chris would agree with, uh, you get the absorbed dose, you weight that with uh, radiation and tissue weighting factors to get an effective dose, i.e. the dose that would apply to the whole body. And our position is that no better alternative exists and the average implicit in those is accepted for protection purposes. Uh, Chris, uh, some years ago, suggested what he calls the second event theory, uh, that binding of strontium in DNA uh, causes uh, a, a type of uh, overburdening of the repair system. It's, it was a brilliant idea that it, it is, as far as I've been told by people who understand that better than me, mathematically incorrect. Uh, the photoelectric excess effect we've talked about, it exists, but my, uh, the experts I've been talking to are assuring me that it's nowhere near as big as proposed by Chris. Uh, we feel that epidemiology supports the use of those for internal emitters if we look at the nuclear workers, if we look at Raven, which is consistent for minus and residential people, and where you get similar doses, both from epidemiology and the symmetry. Uh, if we look at uh, Torotrust, uh, uh, a radioactive contrast medium that was used many years ago, if you look at plutonium, so we think that there is a burden on our back that we can still perhaps move this car a little bit more. Thank you. We'll take a, a maximum 15 minute break and get back for an interaction and questions. Thank you. Oh, before you go, I'm putting on some music. <coughs> that music has been made by Chris. Four questions from the public. If the two speakers would like to ask each other any questions for a few minutes. Any hands up from either of you? Okay, yes. No, I want to I have a whole list of questions I want to ask Dr. Uh, Dr. Valentin Jack. Hello, Jack. But I want to talk to you about this because it's very rare that I, I've never had a chance to sit face to face with somebody who is such a key person in the organization that I have been consistently attacking for near on 15 years. Okay? And so, in, a, in the kindest way possible, and without any sort of hostility, I, I really do want to try to get to the bottom of, of, of where you're coming from and, and, and how, you, how you deal with this, this question of radiation risk. Because I did notice that in, in, your, in your exposition, and, and lot, a lot of that I disagree with, but I, I don't need to go there. Um, I have, but I have some specific concerns. I mean, first, first, the first thing I noticed in, in that was that you, you said that the ICRP themselves take their evidence from the UN. Is that, is that true, or do you take your evidence from all over? 
yes to both of these because uh, I would say the most important single source quote is the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation. However, that is basically a reader's digest of radiation biology and radiation physics, so it comprises a lot of different summaries. In addition to that, we look at other organizations like Bayer in the United States, and of course, a lot of national institutions that like NRPB, HPA now that you do not like, IRSM that you perhaps don't dislike quite as much, if I understand you correctly, and several other such organisations. We, we try to look at information from many sources. Right, because that leads me to the question of why it is you don't look at any of the sources that we uh, address, and the sources that we regularly um, quote. So, so there has been, like you say, uh, like a, 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 an iron curtain if you like, between the ECRR, or, or what used to be the people who have now become the ECRR and the ICRP. And there's a very large uh, amount of evidence in the peer review literature, but also outside the peer review literature, in what we call the grey literature. Um, and indeed, the European uh, Commission and the European Union have, have said in, in many documents, and the WHO too, although they probably don't believe this, but although they say it, that, that one should look at all sources of information. And as scientists, we should look at all sources of information. You can give them different weightings. But the fact is that you have never cited any one of the uh, articles which falsify or argue that your, 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 argue, your, that your levels of, of risk are, are out by an enormous amount. Why? Well, now, this puts me in a slightly difficult position, of course, because I tend to agree with you that we should have quoted some of your stuff. And, of course, uh, since we uh, do not believe in uh, a lot of the things that you're saying, we, we should then have said why we don't believe in that. But, but uh, I tend to agree that uh, ICFP should have done a better job in, in uh, reacting, as it were, uh, to some of your stuff. Um, and, uh, of course, I'm not a civil servant. Uh, it, if you've got the scientific secretary of ICRP, you press a button on its back and then it says what it's supposed to say. Now I'm retired, so I can say, yes, I think so. But uh, by and large, I don't think there are too many people who are greatly impressed by the, the evidence you're giving. I think it would have been much wiser in that situation to state more clearly why we're not impressed, as it were. Uh, um, that that's also giving you a chance to come back again and say, here's why I think you're wrong and so forth, because that is, of course, the way forward to make sure that we, well, if, if we don't agree with that, each other, but at least I, I agree with you that we should understand why we don't agree with each other. I mean, for example, this book here was published in 2006, and prior to that, the Cherry Minority Report was published in 2004, and both of those uh, documents, and this one certainly gives hundreds of references, from the Russian language literature, which, which show extraordinarily enormous effects from radioactivity uh, uh, on, on, genome, on, on genetic damage in plants, so it can't be radiophobia, in fish, which can't be radiophobia, an enormous document here with evidence which has been entirely ignored and is not mentioned in any of the United Nations or the ICRP or the Bayer documents or any of these documents which you must surely concede people would think are, are, are driven by biased scientists who want to sustain the idea that radiation is what you say it is. <clears throat> I've already agreed that it would have made more sense for us to quote more of your stuff. Um, with us, I then mean the mainstream community, not just ICRP, but Hanskir, Bear, and, and such like. Uh, so I don't know what more I can say. We, we're not talking here about individual results because uh, for most of them, I believe uh, some of my colleagues would come up with various technical comments. Uh, but the, the philosophical idea that, that we ought to comment more about your work, I, I tend to agree. Okay, well here's another question. Do you, uh, why do you think there are childhood cancer clusters near nuclear sites? Does this not in itself falsify the knowledge? I'm sure you're aware that there are also studies that can show that there are clusters of leukemia around nuclear power plant sites where they never built a nuclear power plant. 
Yes, but I'm sure if you've read any of our, our, our information, you, you'd know that, that, that those studies are, are, are confounded by the fact that the places where they are going to build the nuclear power plants are on coastal areas which are contaminated with radioactivity or levels of high rainfall. Well, I, if, if we're talking confounders, I think that is one of the main types of criticism that we have with all of your epidemiological studies, uh, and that the, uh, you don't have uh, sufficient controls of the various biases, which can be very large in some of these cases, and uh, ICRP does not have an official position on this. Uh, of course, since we haven't commented specifically on this, I can only talk as a person involved in ICRP and, and what I know that people in ICRP say uh, in their discussions. But, but in principle, uh, people do not agree with your epidemiology, can show lots of examples of other epidemiological studies where you get quite contradicting results of lower uh, cancer risk. Well, the, the most famous one is, of course, Bernie Cohen and Radon. Uh, you must be aware of that, that, that he shows very clearly um, and falsely, of course, uh, a health effect of radiation. Yes, I don't we need to go to Cohen and, and, and all that stuff. I mean, we'd be here forever. Um, but you, you can, these, these, these arguments all disappear, these arguments about confounding, disappear in the case of the infant leukemias after Chernobyl. I mean, this surely is something that you cannot possibly support uh, any, any argument, whatever, because these children were in the womb at the time of the Chernobyl accident. They were reported by five different groups in different countries in different peer-reviewed literature papers. And taken together, they must show that at the levels of exposure that, that, that existed, you know, micro sieverts of exposure, you had a statistically significant excess of infant leukemias in those children. Now, how can you possibly explain that? I can't, but on the other hand, I don't think you have enough explanations either. I, I honestly don't think that you can convince me that you're right. But uh, we, we turn into technical arguments where I think we would have ha had to sit with the papers in front of ourselves, uh, send each other emails, send each other reports, go through the arguments slowly but surely. And wouldn't that be a clever way of continuing a discussion between ICRP and ECRR? Well, yes and no, but I can tell you one thing is that we wouldn't be here tonight if I hadn't been throwing rotten eggs at you for 15 years. <laughs> I mean, it was only, it's only as a result of bringing pressure on you people by chaining myself to nuclear power stations, writing in the literature, playing songs on the banjo, and, and using every possible method available to draw to the attention of the public the fact that your risk model is bankrupt. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Very Are you sure that you wouldn't have had more success if you had just come up friendly like and um, talk to the people at HPA? <laughs> well, come along. I've been in the Cherry Committee. I've been in the Depleted Uranium Oversight Board. I know how these people work, man. I mean, you know, the, the, the skullduggery and, and the kind of shenanigans that went on in those government committees are just, just are all written about. And maybe you've read them, but maybe you haven't. But they're in all the books that I've written, and probably they're all on the internet as well. And those things happen. I mean, one of the secretariat of the Cherry Committee actually resigned. This was a nuclear industry woman, Marion Hill, resigned with a letter arguing that the Cherry Committee the chairman and the secretary were biased. I know that Marion retired. Uh, I know that you're very unhappy with uh, Infadi, who, who of course uh, was quote, in your camp, unquote, uh, another secretariat member. I've heard many stories from Cherry too, uh, not all of them very favourable for you, but somehow it, it's the wrong thing to, to work about who did the wrong thing up that time, can't we look forward at how can we be more constructive instead? Yes, I agree. Um, I've been asked to ask you this, and I think you may be already given the answer, but I'd like you to give it again. Can the ICRP model be used by governments to predict the consequences of a nuclear accident in terms of the, 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 the cancer you? I think basically no, because the uncertainties are too large. Now, I think the uncertainties we are talking about would be in the order of an order of magnitude, and I think you're talking about two orders of magnitude, uh, and therefore we have a difference. But I think 
the one order of magnitude that I'm talking about is enough to say that it's not useful for that sort of prognosis. Well, what's the point of it then? <laughs> well, you get an upper limit, of course. Uh, you, you think that your, your most likely uh, number of cases would be x, but 10 times x cannot be excluded. Okay, okay, okay. But then that means that it is useful. Just that assuming that you've got this range of... of um, I mean, I'm talking now formally, right? Would, would, would the government be formal, formally reasonable in employing the risk model of the ICRP to calculate the, the, the risks, you know, the cancer yield from some hypothetical uh, explosion at, at, at Barsbeck, say, for example, even if they could then say, well, you know, uh, on the basis that it might be ten times that, that's possible. Well, I, I think it would automatically be misused by both camps, uh, and that therefore it, it is not. Uh, you, you don't do it like that. You, you, you look at individual doses, the highest individual doses, and calculate wh wh which is the sort of area where people should not live, which is the sort of area where they should have special means of quick evacuation in case of an emergency and so forth. But uh, the, this number exercise, uh, I, I think it's just silly. It, it, it serves no good purpose whether you're in your camp or in a, a, a pro-nuclear camp or, or an ICRP camp. Well, in this case, I'm in a political camp because, because uh, as you may know, I was the uh, science policy leader for the, so the, for the policy information network for the EU. And these are questions that the, that, the, that the politicians want to know the answer to, okay? When you decide to, to build new nuclear power stations or to repair old ones or, or, or you have any policy relating to nuclear, one of the th questions you have to ask yourself is what would happen if something went wrong? And, and, and therefore they need to know, they need to have some sort of model. And, and, and at the moment, they are using your model. Now, are you saying that they should be or they shouldn't be? It seems to me you're saying they shouldn't be using your model. They should be using... Uh, and no model at all, just guesswork or, or, or what? Well, I certainly wouldn't say that they should use your model because uh, that, that would mean... Uh, getting it, the right answer. No, it, it, it wouldn't. It would, in my opinion, be getting the wrong answer uh, and uh, a, a large expenditure which would not be uh, sensible and which could have been used to save lives in other respects. Okay, here's one more question. The draft ICRP, you remember you were saying you put it out on the internet as a draft for people to make comments. Now that draft actually uh, contained a statement which said that for some internal exposures, or I think for many internal exposures, the concept of absorbed dose was, was impossible, was invalid, was not valid. Now, uh, we would agree with that, of course and maybe you would as well, but it disappeared from the final report, and it's not in the final report, why? Well, in fact, in the annex, uh, the biological annex, uh, there's a whole section which talks about the difficulties. Uh, I, I don't know exactly why the specific statement disappeared, but surely the person who reads these paragraphs in the biological annex uh, will, uh, will be able to see that there's a huge uncertainty. I don't think we're talking about huge uncertainty. We're talking about the inability to use absorbed dose for internal radionuclides. Yes. Well, as you've seen, the ICRP position is that it's possible to use it, albeit with large uncertainties. What do you call a large uncertainty? What do I call a large uncertainty? Well, um, certainly two orders of magnitude is a very large uncertainty. So, so it could be an error by two orders of magnitude for certain internal exposures, that we agree. I would hate for you to go home and say, Jack agreed with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I need to have an answer. <laughs> well, then the answer is, I don't agree with you. <laughs> but you just said two orders of magnitude. Yes, but uh, you can find, I'm sure you can find an exceptional case a specific case where there would actually be 
that sort of an uncertainty. Remember, it can also go in the other direction. And I'm sure that you can find, in most cases, uncertainties which are less than one order of magnitude, which I would find normal. If, if we look at the existing evidence, uh, I, I don't think you've got enough evidence to prove your case. The existing evidence is three orders of magnitude. If we take the, t take the child leukemia clusters around nuclear sites, we're talking about three orders of magnitude. Well, that's what you're claiming on the basis of a handful of cases. I'm claiming it on the basis of the German study, the Aldermaston study, the study at Sellafield, the study at Harwell, and, and, and numerous other studies. The only answer which you've given to me is that they found mild, min, minor excesses of leukemia in an extremely biased and rather stupid study done by Richard Dole, in which they, they were looking at particular sites along the south coast of, of, of England where there was already uh, pollution, as a later study by uh, Alexander et al. showed associated with contamination of the sediment nearby. Yes, but ju just as an aside, let's not throw too much rotten tomatoes on Sir Richard. Uh, Sir Richard, just to let everybody know, was the person who took on the tobacco industry by proving that tobacco causes cancer. He was the person who proved that there is uh, a radiation risk even down to the lowest dose by looking at radiologists. He was the person who first told Annie Stewart that her early results didn't prove anything and then said to her, which she never liked, but he actually said to her very clearly, now that you've changed your, your analysis, I agree with you. And he, he stood up in public to say that. He is the person who's actually been awarded by the Swedish uh, Academy of Sciences their gold medal for radiation protection. I think you can't really say that he would be biased by the nuclear industry. I'm afraid I shocked up Sir Richard Dole to the Danish Committee for Scientific Dishonesty in 2004. So I've already said that, and I can back it up with all sorts of documentation too. Sir Richard Dole may have been doing some interesting stuff in the 1950s, but, but later on he became very much an advocate of the nuclear industry, and one of, was one of the main people behind the, these population mixing stuff. Uh, and he never believed that the, that the Sellafield leukemia cluster was caused by the radiation. And neither do I, <coughs> though, surely for different reasons. Okay, well, let's, we have to open this up to the audience at some point, I think. Um, but I just want to say about your ethics. Uh, I think that anyone who's interested in this, the, the, the ethical position of the European Committee on Radiation Risk is quite different from the ICRP. <coughs> the ICRP ethical situation is a very outdated system called utilitarianism, which was developed by Bentham and John Stuart Mill. And basically, it, with utilitarianism, you can have a slave society because the advantages of the many outweigh, you know, the advantages to the few. And so we don't believe we believe in human rights, and we believe that you have the absolute human 